Our sermon scripture for today is taken out of Leviticus, chapter 22, verses 17 through 33. Where it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelites and say to them, If any of you, whether an Israelite or a foreigner residing in Israel, presents a gift for a burnt offering to the Lord, either to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering, you must present a male without defect from the cattle, sheep, or goat in order to that it may be accepted on your behalf. Do not bring anything with a defect, because it will not be accepted on your behalf. When anyone brings from the herd or flock a fellowship offering to the Lord to fulfill a special vow or as a free will offering, it must be without defect or blemish to be acceptable. Do not offer to the Lord the blind, the injured, or the maimed or anything with warts or festering or running sores. Do not place any of these on the altar as a food offering presented to the Lord. You may, however, present as a free will offering an ox or a sheep that is deformed or stunted, but it will not be accepted in fulfillment of a vow. You must not offer to the Lord an animal whose testicles are bruised, crushed, torn, or cut. You must not do this in your own land, and you must not accept such animals from the land of a foreigner and offer them as the food of your God. They will not be accepted on your behalf because they are deformed and have defects. The Lord said to Moses, when a calf, a lamb, or a goat is born, it is to remain with its mother for seven days. From the eighth day on, it will be acceptable as a food offering presented to the Lord. Do not slaughter a cow or sheep and its young on the same day. When you sacrifice a thank offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. It must be eaten that same day. Leave none until morning. I am the Lord. Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. Do not profane my holy name. For I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who made you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. May God have blessing on his holy word. As I was conducting this sermon for this week, I thought about it. And how there are many books in the Bible that we as humans just kind of skip over. And Leviticus is probably the number one skipped over book in the Old Testament. Because Leviticus presents a challenge for us. The very title itself means about the Levite. And so that, in part, may give us some um, knowledge of why it's so unappealing. Because in large part, it describes how the priestly family, the Levites, should present the right sacrifices to the Lord. So there's a lot of law in this book. But keep in mind this, that all of it is presented as a part of a wider story. The story of God and his people. Having been been delivered from Egypt, the Israelites are in the wilderness at this point, now encamped at Mount Sinai. And Leviticus picks up where Exodus left off. But right at the end of Exodus, the tabernacle was completed according to God's instructions and then was filled with God's glory. Leviticus begins then with God summoning Moses to come to the tabernacle. And he's going to explain how his covenant people should approach him in worship. 
And this was vital because before Sinai, God's glory had never formally resided in Israel's midst in a central place like the tabernacle. There wasn't a structured set of sacrifices and no official priesthood. What's more, the Israelites' own knowledge of such things were, was sorely lacking. For centuries, they had been slaves in Egypt, a land of many gods and pagan rituals. The concept of worship and a godly life had become very distorted. And we can see their stubborn attachment to pagan rituals when they worshipped the golden calf. So now God decided that he needed to give the much needed instructions to the Israelites. Simply put, he will tell the people how to properly live in covenant with him. And we begin to see this and we begin to see the book as much more than just the Levites. And it's for everyone. For what did God say to the Israelites back in Exodus 19? Even before he gave any of the sacrificial laws. He said this. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. From the very least of them to the greatest, they were priest, a people holy to God, devoted to his worship. Here we also have a sense of how this book is still relevant today. Because has the God speaking in Leviticus really changed? <coughs> he is still the God of the covenant, a God in relationship with his people. He's still a God who graciously provides atonement for sin through blood. He's still a holy God who calls his children to be holy as well. He still desires to be worshipped by his people with acceptable sacrifice and offerings. And this is what we see in our text. The Lord instructs his people about holy sacrifices. First he says, think about the Lord whom they're offered to. In this passage, we focus on the latter half of chapter 22. And in some study Bibles, it's actually titled, Offerings Accepted and Not Accepted. And that's what this section is about. Offerings. Not offerings as we know it, but offerings in sacrificing one's um, possessions. Now, in one way, this was familiar. It was a familiar practice of the people of God. They might have not regulated themselves on a si certain system for sacrifice, but those in fellowship with God have always wanted to present him with their gifts. <clears throat> I want us to recall the offerings of Cain and Abel back in Genesis. It wasn't a command. It wasn't a law. It was just done as if by instinct to acknowledge the goodness of the Lord. Leviticus is built on that same assumption that God's covenant people will gladly bring him their offerings. We need to view these sacrifices in the right way then. Because Israel definitely wasn't the only nation who made offerings. It was a practice in many cultures and religions. See, a common idea behind gifts to gods was that they were basically bribes given to the gods in order to get what you want. But the Lord wanted his people to have a different perception of this. 
These offerings were under the umbrella of an existing relationship, the covenant of grace. They were a part of the continuing story and the history of redemption. So God addresses this particular section, not just to the priests, the Levites, but to everyone in Israel. In verses 17 and 18, where it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, and to all the children of Israel. We see that it is proper worship, and it's to concern all of God's covenant people. And to impress on the importance, Moses reminds them of where it's directed. If any of you, whether an Israelite or a foreigner residing in Israel, presents a gift for a burnt offering to the Lord, either to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering. When you read Leviticus, you find that the last phrase that is used to the Lord again and again. Every act of worship is described as being to the Lord. Tradition and habit being what it was, the Israelites probably had forgotten this, just as we might. That as we lift up our prayers of praise, our songs of worship, or even the best of our talents and time, as they are offered to God, they need to be offered consciously, reverently, thoughtfully to the Lord. The people of Israel had a visual cue for this in the tabernacle. That's where God showed his presence whenever they came to the tent of meeting. They could be reminded that here God is present in the house of the Lord. See, that was the greatest blessing that God granted the Israelites, that he was in their midst. Listen to what it says in Leviticus 26, verse 12. It says, I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. That truth gave a powerful incentive of offering worship that was in every way true and holy. Think of whose presence you approach, whose face you seek. Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. In a way, that's all God should have said. I am the Lord. Because in reality, it should have moved them, and it should move us to revere his name. The same thought is taken a little bit further in the last two verses of our text. It first puts it negatively. Do not profane my holy name, for I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. That, unfortunately, is the inclination of humans when worshiping, to treat it as something small when it is and should be holy. But God then puts it a little more positively, for he follows it with, I am the Lord who made you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. If you're keeping track, he says, I am the Lord, more times. Two more times, exactly. And in this, God describes himself. He is the God who sanctifies his people. And he is the God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. Israel is pointed to that defining moment of their history, the deliverance from oppression, the redemption from slavery, and it should point us to ours as well. This is the Lord to whom they present their offerings, the God who saved them 
in his sovereign grace. It's like God reminded them every time they heard the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. God deserves humble reverence, dedicated obedience, and holy gifts. He is a faithful, compassionate, and almighty God. All in Leviticus, it is presented to us a glorious picture of God's character, a picture that is broadened and deepened in the New Testament because there we see the characteristics revealed in the love of God, the holiness of God, the justice and mercy of God. And we see all these things more deliberately as he displays them in Jesus Christ, who came to reveal the Father as both high priest and holy sacrifice. Jesus offered himself to God so that his precious blood could atone for all of our sins. And a lot of times this confuses people with Leviticus because it makes them wonder, has it Jesus then closed this book by his death, declared that it is finished? Even if we do read it, how does it apply to our lives? All this rituals and regulations. And the answer is that we can look and we ought to look for the precious truths that still remain. The truth about our God that have not changed. The principles for his people that are still in effect. We look not to be bound by all the particular rules of the Levit uh, in Leviticus, but to receive good and faithful direction from God's own mouth recorded in this book and passed down to us. For in a, a way, our duty as a priestly people is even greater than it was for Israel. Because we know the name above all names, Jesus Christ. We know how incredibly of a high price that he paid to clear the way, to atone for our sins, to secure our salvation. Our motive for sacrifice has been multiplied greatly. I want us to listen to the words of Romans 12, verse 6, no, verse 1, sorry. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, to view, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. Notice what Paul says in that passage. He knew that the age of the temple and the worship that was in it was completely finished in the death of Christ. But he also knew that God still calls believers. He still calls believers in Jesus to a life of sacrifice. That is everything we are, everything we have, must be presented to the Lord. And we do, when we do this, Paul says, we do it by the mercies of God. We're moved by his mercy in his son, Jesus Christ. We're stirred up by Jesus' sacrifice. He's eager to present our offerings acceptable to God, our Father. I want us to also see the guidelines by which they're offered. Out of the book of Leviticus, or out of the law of God, there's probably one principle that stands above the rest. And we find it in Leviticus 11.44. It says, you will be holy for I am holy. Because of the Lord's perfect separateness and moral purity. He expects his people to be holy as well. He is set apart from all stain of sin. So we ought to be as well. The Lord showed the Israelites just how complete 
this holiness needed to be. The many laws in Leviticus, together with those in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, give the outline for an entire life of purity. Purity with reverence to bodily health, daily food, personal relationships, and conduct. And of course, purity in connection to official worship. Over 125 times in this book, the people are warned not to become ceremonially unclean. And they're exhorted to use the means of purification that God has provided. And it all went back to God's character. You will be holy, for I am holy. Just one example of the need for holiness. We have these laws regarding offerings. In Israel, a sacrifice could be given for a number of reasons. Some worshipers did it out of gratitude to the Lord. Others did it for fellowship with God, for the need of atonement for sin. But whenever a offering was presented, for whatever occasion, it needed to meet these criteria. Earlier in Leviticus, God speaks about this, but in our passage, it is made explicit. The worshiper was to be pure, and his sacrifice was also to be pure. It is stated repeatedly, beginning in verse 19. You must present a male without defect from the, she from the cattle, sheep, or goats. And then it's followed a bit later with an explanation of what sort of defect is meant. It says, do not offer the Lord the blind, the injured, or the maimed or anything with warts or festering or running sores. Do not place any of these on the altar as a food offering presented to the Lord. In short, the quality of an offering reveals the quality of the heart, reveals whether or not it is truly dedicated to the Lord or not. So whenever a person brought his gift to the tabernacle. He was to bring an animal that had value to him. He was to give a gift that he might someday use. After all, it costs very little to give away something that is second rated or something that won't be really missed. But to give up the first and best portion to give up what is useful, that is a true sacrifice. It's a holy sacrifice. By making this kind of offering, the people show that they wouldn't withhold from God, even that which was near and dear to them. By this, they showed how much they valued being and staying in relationship with him. <coughs> For the whole reason they could bring offerings in the first place was because of the Lord and his blessings and his kindness. It was his land, just as it is today. It was his produce. It was his blessing and grace. All these sacrifices brought right from the finest cow down to the best of oil, everything flowed from his bounty, freely granted. So were they remembering the Lord in whose presence they stood, the God who mightily saved them, forgave them, and provided for them? An unblemished offering flowed out of something that's always been imperative to God, an attitude of reverence and awe, a spirit of love and thankfulness. Sure, God knew a person could give an outwardly acceptable offering, even one that was top-rated without really meaning it, because that's exactly what Cain did. 
and God rejected his gift. But a sacrifice can easily err in the other direction too. For in, in Malachi's time, the Israelites came to think that God didn't really care about the quality of offering, just as long as there was something there on the altar. But remember the words that God spoke through the, his prophet. He said, when you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as a sacrifice, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifice a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be, be feared among the nation. So in other words, God challenges the people. He says, you would not give this to your earthly king or ruler, a mere man. So how can you give it to me? A true offering is not to be poor. It is not to be deficient. For here is something that has never changed. The Lord God isn't pleased with half-hearted service. These are the words of God's people to consider, no matter what the age we live in. For we too, out of habit or tradition, might be inclined to give God anything as long as it's something. But it could well end up being second-rated or second-best. In reality, our gifts to God may end up being whatever is left over. Because really think about it. We might be giving God whatever's left over out of our energy after hours of work. Whatever's left of our time after another busy day. If it's then that we only think of giving something back to God. If it's then that we're only sitting down to serve his kingdom or giving a bit of time to prayer and Bible study, then let's be honest. These two are defected and blemished offerings. Leftovers and afterthoughts for God are today's equivalent to offerings that are blind, injured, and maimed. And in truth, because they're not the best that we have, they are covered with warts and festering sores. So we must ask ourselves, shall we offer only to God whatever we cannot use ourselves? Whatever time and energy we won't really miss. As a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, God asks that we offer what is pure and precious. It's not that God needs a certain amount of hours per day in prayer or needs the biggest and fattest animal. Our God only desires the wholehearted attention and affection of his precious creation. A true relationship. Amen. If you will please be seated. Before we end in prayer, uh, Ms. Stan, Mr. Stan and Ms. Pat Watson have uh, explained to me that they would like to join our family, our church. So if they will come forward, um, we'll proceed with their wishes. Terry, did Miss Linda Gray leave? Okay. She wishes to join as well if she... Um, comes back in. If not, we'll do it another day. <laughs> okay.
do love y'all very much. Okay, Ms. Pat, I'll start with you. One question. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you transfer your membership and loyalty to this congregation? Awesome. Pat, or Stan, sorry, the same question. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you transfer your membership and loyalty to this congregation? I do. Awesome. Hi. All right. Ms. Linda Gray. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you transfer your membership and loyalty to this congregation? Awesome. On behalf of the church, we would like to present each of you with a confession of faith and a Bible. Let me be the first to welcome you into the family. We love y'all. All right. And after we end in prayer, please come forward and give our new family members the right hand of fellowship. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we are so grateful for every addition that you see fit to add to this congregation. Lord, we know you lead people each and every day into your arms. We ask that you go out into the world, that you help us to lead others to you, to be a light, to be a beacon for you, so that the darkness is not so overcoming. We see it each and every day, Father, that the darkness is and it's out there and it's looming, but help us to be your light. Help us to bring people to come to know you. Father, as we depart from this place, go with us. Let your words shine through us and just forgive us where we fail you. Amen. Please come forward and give the right hand of fellowship. <clears throat> 